You're tuned into Dentist Brain Candy, where we bring relevant, meaningful, value-filled knowledge bombs straight to your brain. Featuring your host and oral surgeon, Dr. Brian McClelland. Now sit back and enjoy the sweet treat of Dentist Brain Candy. Hello, hello, DBC peeps, and welcome to this week's episode of Dentist Brain Candy. I am Dr. Brian McClelland. Thank you for tuning in. A couple housekeeping items. Um, First of all, June 10th. We have a full day on uh, dental implants. You guys are invited. Center place in Spokane. If you go to Eventbrite and you search Liberty Oral Surgery Dental Implants, CE events, you will find the full day. We have Dr. Ken Parrish coming and WEO Media. The morning will be very clinical on advancements in dental implants. And the afternoon will be on how to generate more dental implant patients and to explode your dental implant practice. Please come. Love to have you in October. We have a CPR renewal, OSHA update, HIPAA lunch and learn. And in the afternoon, I will be talking about wisdom teeth for about 30 to 45 minutes. And Dr. Uh, Brennan Olson will be uh, talking about XNAV and guided surgery. You guys are invited to all these. Sign up at eventbrite.com. All right. This week, I'm going to start off with continuing on our book, uh, Limitless by Jim Quick. And we're in part four of the book called Limitless Methods. So we're going to talk about the methodology to become limitless. So focus. Chapter 11 is on focus. What's the difference between someone performing at superhero levels and someone failing to ever discover their superpowers? In many cases, it's a matter of focus. Focus allows us to train our brain power on a particular task to burn through that task. Don Potty points out that concentration is like a muscle that gets stronger the more you exercise it. In layperson's terms, what this means is that the physical clutter in your surroundings competes for your attention, which results in decreased performance and increased anxiety and stress levels. You might not even realize it, but all the input you're getting on any given day is causing you a considerable amount of stress. What both Greenberg and Fund, F-U-N-T, are identifying is the need for all of us to have more time when our minds are not cluttered. And distractions can be a serious time sink, as you all know. You have to completely shift your thinking. It takes you a while to get into whatever it is you're trying to focus on, and it takes you a while to get back and remember what you were, where you were at. So to help you focus, you first want to breathe. Now, we've already talked about the value of taking deep, cleansing breaths as a part of your morning routine, but doing the same thing is valuable whenever you need to recenter yourself. Holistic expert Andrew Wheel, MD, developed a breathing tool that he calls the 478 method, and it works like this. First of all, exhale completely through your mouth, making a whoosh sound. Close your mouth and inhale quietly through your nose to a mental count of four. Hold your breath for a count of seven. Exhale completely through your mouth, making a swoosh sound to the count of eight, the 478 method. Wow, fancy. Uh, Number two, do something that has been causing you stress. This goes back to what we talked about earlier regarding procrastination. As we now all know, things weighing on our minds are going to continue weighing our minds until we deal with them. Deal with the stressful task, and then you can get back to everything else you want to do with increased focus. Number three, schedule time for distractions. It might be a challenge for you to turn off your phone or your email when you need to focus, but if you actually schedule time to do it, it'll be much easier to let things go. So before we move on, take a good look at your to-do list and identify thing or things on it that is likely to invade your thoughts until you get it done. Formulate a plan for dealing with this task using some of the uh, anti-procrastination tools that you now know. Do something right now that changes your productivity environment so you can do a better job of staying on task. Practice a technique for calming your busy mind. Does it work for you? You know, this makes me think about my wife's sister. She loves things and shopping at gift stores and value village and just with all of her treasures has more and more things or what I would call clutter or treasures in her house. And I wonder if we had like a parallel universe, if we could declutter how that would affect her overall feelings and how she's doing and those sorts of things. I think it might be very helpful. Now, the next chapter, chapter 12, is on study. And I feel like this chapter is probably the least valuable for dentists that are listening to this. Because one thing I know for sure, for all of you to get through what you had to get through in dental school, you had to become professionals at studying. And you could probably write a book on effective studying. So I'm going to be kind of brief with this one because you guys are already experts at this. But this is what I got out of it. 
that, that there is four levels of competence. There's unconscious incompetence. There's conscious incompetence. There's conscious competence instead of incompetence and unconscious competence. Now, the keys to get from conscious competence to unconscious competence is obvious. It's practice. You make progress as you practice. So just think of this. If you go from like being able to do a task, but you have to consciously think about that task to be competent at it, to a point of where you don't even have to think about that task to become competent, that's where you want to go. The fifth level is true mastery. And if we're going to be a master, we got to need to study like a superhero. Most of us were taught to studying was all about reviewing material over and over and over so we could spit it back out during a test. We're going to talk in a moment about why cramming is such a bad idea, but suffice it to say the process is far from optimal. The most successful people in the world are lifelong students. But what about cramming? An all-nighter is an age-old study tradition that many people continue long after their school days are over. Cramming is associated with emotional, mental, and physical impairments that reduce the body's ability to cope with its environment. Cramming usually requires foregoing all or at least much of one's normal amount of sleep, and this can wind up undermining the very purpose of cramming. But an adequate amount of sleep is also critical for academic success. These results are consistent with emerging research suggesting that sleep deprivation impedes learning. Here are seven of his favorite, Jim Quick's favorite, simple habits to unlimit your studies. Number one, employ active recall. Active recall is a process through which you review material and then immediately check to determine how much of it you have been have remembered. To employ active recall, review the material you're studying, then close the book, turn off the video or lecture, and write down or recite everything you remember from what you just reviewed. Now, look at the material again. How much did you remember? Habit number two. Employ spaced repetition. If you space out your reviews of the material, focusing more heavily on information that you haven't retained in the past, you're using your brain to the best of its abilities. Habit number three. I bet you this rings true. It rings really true for me. I discovered somewhere along the lines that if I had a lot of material to remember, I would review it over multiple different occasions, and that's how I could make it stick. Habit number three. Manage the state you're in. If you're feeling great, When the same opportunity arises, you would definitely produce better results in studying. The more positive and resourceful your state, the greater the results you'll produce. Studying is no different. Your posture also controls your state of mind. Habit number four, use your sense of smell. Smells are especially effective at bringing memories from the forefront of our, or to the forefront of our brains. The recent scent of rosemary has been shown to improve memory. Peppermint and lemon promotes concentration. The olfactory bulb has direct connections to two brain areas that are strongly implicated in emotion and memory, the amygdala and the hippocampus. If you're studying for a big test, put a bit of particular essential oil on your wrist while you're studying, and then make sure you do the same thing before you take the test. If you do the same thing in preparing for a big meeting, the results should be, simil- uh, should be similar, and <laughs> you're going to smell fantastic for the big test or that meeting, depending, of course, what kind of essential oil you use. Habit number five, music for the mind. Man, I use music all the time when I study. Even now, I love music when I'm studying or learning. Numerous studies link music to learning. Baroque music seems to have some particularly valuable qualities. Music stabilizes mental, physical, and emotional rhythms to attain a state of deep concentration and focus in which the large amounts of content and information can be processed and learned. Baroque music, such as that composed by Bach, Handel, or Telemann, that is 50 to 80 beats per minute, creates an atmosphere of focus that leads students into deep concentration in the alpha brainwave state. Learning vocabulary, memorizing facts, or reading to this music is highly effective. Amazon Music, Apple Music, and Spotify all have Baroque playlists. And if you want to explore further, each have classical music playlists comprising largely of Baroque music that have been specifically compiled for the purpose of studying. All right, before we go ahead, habit number six. I'm going to do a little experiment. Alexa, play a Baroque playlist. Here's Baroque era classical, including Van Diemen's Band and Johann Sebastian Bach on Amazon Music. That's freaking awesome. I love it. So I'm going to turn this down a little bit, but we're going to Baroque all our way to the end of this podcast. Alexa, volume three. Oh, perfect. Habit six. Listen with your whole brain. There's a very strong connection between listening and learning, and more than a quarter of us are auditory learners, meaning that the primary way in which we learn is through hearing something. 
The human brain has the capacity to digest as much as 400 words per minute of information. But even a speaker from New York City that has salsa talks at around 125 words per minute. This means three quarters of your brain could very well be do something else while someone is speaking to you. So in order for you to hear, you can use the acronym H-E-A-R, which stands for H is for HALT. Do everything you can to tune all of this out and be completely present with whomever you are listening to. E is for empathy. You can imagine yourself in the speaker's shoes. If you can imagine yourself in the speaker's shoes, you're more than likely to learn from this listening experience than if you do it dispassionately. Try and understand where the speaker is coming from and why brings additional substance to what they might be saying and allows you to feel it from their perspective. A is for anticipate and R is for review. Anticipate. Engage in the experience with a state of anticipation. Remember that learning is a state dependent and that what you learn uh, from this speaker will become a long-term memory if you attach an emotion to it. R is for review. If you have the opportunity to directly engage with a speaker, do so. Ask clarifying questions or maybe even for a point to be repeated. If you're in on the position, take notes. Do so. Habit number seven, upgrade your note-taking ability is invaluable. Many people take notes ineffectively. I already know that you guys take awesome notes or you never would have made it through dental school, but here's what he suggests. First, be sure that you understand the purpose for taking these notes. By being clear on your intention with your notes, you're able to distinguish between information that is relevant to you and information that is not. What he's left with is nearly pure content. Likewise, if you take notes with a goal in mind, every note you take will have relevance. One of the key pitfalls to effective note taking is trying to record everything. Even if you were typing your notes, you'd probably only be able to get down about half of what the speaker was saying. I'd recommend handwriting your notes as well. Writing by hand requires you to start processing the material immediately, and that has proven to be more effective. Even when laptops are used solely to take notes, they may still be impairing learning because their use results in shallower processing. Most importantly, make sure you're really listening. After your note-taking session is over, review your notes immediately. This will help you retain the information much more effectively than if you did not read your notes for days. Now, this is something that I could have done during school. I don't think I did this, reviewing my notes. Um, It was usually days or weeks before I reviewed them, but that might have helped me a lot. So a tip for upgrading your note-taking, TIP is an acronym, another one. T is for think. Think why you're taking notes and what you want to get out of it. I is for identify. Listen carefully for the information being presented. And P is for prioritize. Review your notes after the presentation and prioritize the information that is most valuable to you. Next week or next time, we're going to talk about memory. Right now, I want to dig in to uh, an article that is also from October 2021, Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. And the title of this is, What is the Risk of Developing Medication-Related Osteonecrosis in Patients with Extraction Sockets Left to Heal by Secondary Intention? A Retrospective Case Series. And this is by Pippi et al. Tooth and root extractions represent trigger factors for medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaws, or Mirage. The best healing modality for post-extraction sockets is still debated. The aim of the study was to estimate the incidence of mirage after extractions whose sockets were left to heal by secondary intention. In other words, not trying to get primary closure. Methods for this? This was a retrospective case series study and was performed at the Department of, wow, Odontostomatological and Maxillofacial Sciences, Sapinzia University of Rome. Wow. Only patients who underwent non-surgical extractions healed by secondary intentions were included in the study. The following parameters were considered. Age, sex, pathologies for which bisphosphonates or other drugs related to mirage were prescribed, and any local or systemic risk factors, type of drug used, route of administration, number of extractions performed, and the number of sessions required to complete the extraction program. The main outcome variable was the occurrence of mirage. Statistical analysis was performed with SPSS statistical software. The results, 221 patients were treated from 2007 to 2020 with 639 two slash root extractions. All patients were treated under antibiotic prophylaxis and with anesthesia without vasoconstrictors. No cases of mirage occurred. The mean age of patients was 68.02 Eight years of age. Most of the study sample was represented by women undergoing treatment for osteometabolic pathologies, most frequently postmenopausal osteoporosis. 
Alleginate was the most frequently prescribed drug taken orally. Most patients had local and systemic risk factors. Each patient had from 1 to 17 tooth slash root extractions with an a mean of 2.8 during 1 to 4 sessions, average of 1.4. Extractions mainly involved single rooted teeth slash roots equally distributed between the maxilla and mandible. The conclusion, secondary intention healing after non-surgical tooth extraction does not seem to predispose to merange. It can be advisable to perform extractions under antibiotic prophylaxis using anesthetics without vasoconstrictors or chlorhexidine. Now, these are opinions. There is no proof that chlorhexidine or vasoconstrictors will change with or without vasoconstrictors will change the incidence of developing medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaws. Hopefully that was helpful. Basically, it says that you can take out teeth in your average bisphosphonate-taking uh, patient and not have to have a goal of primary closure. You don't have to do primary closure. You can allow it just to heal in by secondary tension without a significant increased risk of mirage. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about here today before we wrap this up is changes in emergency patient presentation to a maxillofacial surgery department during the COVID-19 pandemic. The purpose was to examine possible changes in emergency patient volume and reasons for presentation to an oral surgery department during the pandemic and the resulting uh, contact prohibitions. They hypothesized that the pandemic would lead to fewer patients presenting with emergent conditions. They had a total of 939 patients who presented to the department at Hanover Medical School during the first four weeks of contact prohibitions in Germany, starting from March 23rd to April 19th of 2020, and in comparable periods were examined. The number of patients, reason for presentation, and the required treatments were documented compared to the years 2018 and 2019. They found that the number of patients in 2020 was significantly lower, but sex and age distributions were comparable. Both the absolute and relative frequency of dental diagnosis were significantly lower, while the proportion of patients who were presented with trauma was significantly higher. A significant decrease in uh, patient number to the hospital, despite private practices being closed, was presumably due to patient infection-related concerns. Trauma cases were more frequent in private settings, and traumatic events under the influence of alcohol were frequent. The circumstances and not the absolute number of trauma cases trauma events had changed. So in conclusion, the results of this study suggested that COVID-19 pandemic did have important effects on the use of emergency services in Germany. Well, that's not really a big aha moment right there. It's clear that the number of visits to clinics and hospitals decreased with the immediate shutdown, but there was more trauma-related visits during these times. All right. I hope you enjoyed our broke music in the background. We'll have to see what the response from you guys are and whether or not I should always do podcasts with baroque music in the background or maybe techno electronica dance bluegrass i don't know you guys let me know what kind of music we should have in the background if any all right thanks for tuning in uh, please leave a five star rating and review on your favorite podcast player do it now i know you've been meaning to but you haven't done it yet and you need to it's important to me it's the least you could do to thank me for these podcasts <laughs> and putting up with my terrible sense of humor. All right. Thanks for hopefully laughing at that last joke and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks for tuning in on another episode of Dentist Brain Candy. Don't forget to check out our website for sweet upcoming events and remember to sign up for our newsletter at www.dentistbraincandy.com. There is no guarantee as to the accuracy of this information and no treatment decision should be based on this information presented. Although every attempt is made to be accurate and factual, some items discussed are the opinion of the author and no liability will be assumed for the content presented.